Good evening to our infrastructure lecture family. Sure, we are halfway on this journey, everyone. So welcome to week five of our series. Today, we are obviously hosting alongside Sanlam and UK Zirin. And as usual, I'm your Wednesday evening furniture, Sharon Shanmugam from the SICE Durban Committee. Welcome to our new attendees and welcome to those who are joining us from abroad. It's great to have you with us this evening. As always, we begin with the house rules. Please note that our event is being recorded. Our participant audio and video is disabled. Should you wish to speak, please send me a message uh, directly towards the end of the presentation and I will allow you to speak thereafter. However, it's preferred that you use the Q&A function um, where you can post your questions and then we will address these during the panel discussion. Please feel free to use the chat function to connect with us and your peers. Regarding CPD certificates, uh, firstly, I'll deal with the students. Um, I have confirmed with your lecturers that you will not be needing to receive a certificate in order to secure your credit for your VAC work. So students, you, you rest assured, you do not need the certificates. To our members, we have decided to handle the certificates at the end of the event so that we can accord you one certificate for all the events that you attended in the series. So please wait until the end of the event and then you can send us an email and we'll send you the details as well uh, later on uh, towards the end. Uh, we will continually post our previous recordings. However, I am um, I am told that today's recording, in sorry, last week's recording is still not available. So next week we will post the recording of last week and this week's um, presentation. 
So with that, welcome again to our halfway mark, and I hope you guys are going to enjoy today's presentations. My co-host for the evening is Dr. Moses Kaliswa. Uh, Moses is an experienced forensic structural engineer and concrete material scientist. He is currently a senior lecturer at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, where he teaches courses in structural engineering and construction materials. His research interests are in cement and concrete technology, focusing on durability in, a, in aggressive environments and also on alternative materials. He is active in both local and international scientific circles, where he publishes and presents in conferences and seminars. Moses is a licensed professional engineer and acts as a specialist consultant to the construction industry globally. Welcome, Dr. Kaliswa. I look forward to engaging with you today. As you know, uh, UKZN and SAISI collaborated to create the series together with Sanlam, who are our co-sponsors. Well, they are actually our main sponsor. This week, Sanlam will be represented by Dr. Yusuf Musa, who is a BCom graduate also from UKZN. He, in his portfolio as a business development manager, Yusuf is a product investment specialist for Glacier Life's investment solutions. His role involves presenting to intermediaries at training workshop, workshops and in other public forums. He has more than 16 years of experience in the financial services industry, and previously he served as a business development, development manager for Momentum for 10 years. Welcome, Yusuf. Thank you so much, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Saise, for giving me the opportunity to actually present to you. Uh, good evening to everyone. Um, whilst I'd just like to get my presentation up, um, and I think yeah, it's a warm, sunny day in, in Durban and, and, and summer's upon us, uh, which is a, you know, a change of environment. And I think uh, today you know, there'll be some valuable uh, facts or, uh, that I'll be going through in regards to investments. Now, as a, Sharon has, has mentioned, you know, that some of you are students and, and probably thinking, okay, how, do I, how am I going to be tech smart? And you know, some of you are probably coming to the middle age of, of your, your life to say, okay, how do I increase wealth? Um, and some are at retirement or getting into retirement to say, okay, have I created enough wealth? And what are my options in regards to income? So the, the topic of conversation today is you know, being tax savvy, being tax smart. And I will be going through a high level presentation just for your understanding and trying to make it as simple um, for you to, to see, okay, well, how does investments work specifically and how, do you, how can you create tax efficiencies within those investments? Now, very importantly, before I get into the de de details of being tax smart, you know, why is it important to have, have advice? So why do you need a financial advisor, specifically, you know, a Sunlam financial advisor? Um, they have to understand your personal circumstance, understand your need. Uh, what do you actually need in specifically, whether it's growth or accumulation of wealth over a period of time? And, you know, how do we create these tax efficiencies, giving investments using different types of solutions? And you've probably heard, uh, you know, in the last year or so, or two years, as to how markets have been volatile, crashed, uh, regained. And, you know, there's a lot of other conversations with regards to crypto, et cetera. But today we're going to speak about, you know, the investments or proper in investments as to uh, unit trust, et cetera. So from a Sunlam advisor perspective, you know, they, you need to understand that they are registered to give advice uh, okay. according to the FASE Act. They're qualified and they, they're knowledgeable and you have to have this trustworthiness with them because your financial advisor until the day you die will actually be there at your core. So it's important, you know, that you understand that and, and know that your financial advisor is a very integral part uh, of your business or in engaging with your investments. So a question that clients um, ask and a lot of the time intermediaries like the like advisors come to us and say, well, you know, clients have a specific amount of, uh, of money that they would like to invest, whether it be a recurring investment. Uh, and I'll, I'll discuss a little further on uh, as to the products that or the, the vehicles that you are able to use. But 
in, in some instances, it's okay, I have a recurring investment that I would like to accumulate wealth over a period of time or specific amount of period of time. Or have I planned enough for retirement? Have I got a retirement annuity or using the pension or provident fund? And is that going to be enough? Because come retirement for the next, until you die, you will not be receiving an income because you will, you will retire, you will not be working. So you will need to receive a, a specific amount of income and have you actually saved enough for that income. Now there's something that we, have, we call on the investment space called discretionary money. And discretionary money, all that means is money that you've actually say you've saved up or you've sold an item, et cetera. Uh, and we have something called compulsory money. And compulsory money is what uh, you would use your two thirds compulsory at retirement. So there's just different terminologies. Discretionary, we also call it voluntary as well. Because uh, let's face it, when we do get to retirement or we do or try to save over a period of time, we are actually trying uh, to build wealth, to use that for a specific income, whether it's travel, entertainment, et cetera. And at retirement, that our needs have actually changed as well. Now, what's also important that you may see this on the chart is that, you know, do you, do you have a need to counter the effects of inflation? Now, inflation is quite a big talking point. It's like almost like a silent killer, if you'd like to think of it in that way. Um, and this slide actually depicts it quite well. Because in 1970, a VW Beetle cost you about a thousand odd rand. And in 2020, or currently, a pair of socks will actually cost you the same amount. So inflation is there. It does, yes, increase. And you can see during the, the decades um, how a thousand rand, what it would actually have bought you uh, in those specific decades. So it's important that we understand how do we counter inflation and how do we look at different investment solutions out there. Another interesting fact, and yes, there's a lot of percentages, I don't expect you to read all of them, is that South Africa does experience a retirement crisis. And how so? Um, because of the saving culture that we, we lack of or we don't actually adhere to, because we think at retirement, you know, we will continue working um, and have we actually saved enough? And the stat is currently uh, is around 8%, approximately 8%, of clients who are saving into or, or retirement cannot, will, will be able to retire and the 92% will not be able to retire comfortably. So that means uh, either finding different jobs or continue working uh, and you know, even going to, to their families and looking for the, even their kids. So it's important from a young age that we get this tech or the saving culture, uh, especially for our retirement. And I think my emphasis is on retirement uh, because uh, what I will show you is that this is how it starts in the life cycle uh, when trying to save money. So let's talk about this. Um, we call this this tax efficient frontier. Where do we actually start? So if you're a student, even if you're in the middle or are coming to retirement, we need to know that, yes, we have a specific retirement vehicle, whether it be a retirement annuity a pension or a provident. Now, why? invest into a retirement annuity because it is tax efficient. You are not taxed uh, right up till uh, retirement. Yes, the two thirds of that retirement money is then compulsory money, which we, you will use to invest into either a compulsory living annuity or a life annuity. And yes, on the income, you will then be taxed. But however, however pre-retirement, when you are contributing to that retirement annuity, there is no taxation, to put it in very simple terms. In actual fact, you receive 27.5% uh, uh, or 350,000 where you can maximize this tax efficiency of your salary amount. So if you take the 27.5 or 350, there's a small calculation that we do um, at Glacier or your financial advisor can do for you where you can create a tax efficiency and you can re receive an annual tax rebate. So when you're submitting annually to SARS, um, you're, by having a retirement annuity, it actually reduces the tax that you're going to pay over. So that's one very big advantage that you need to take note of. Also at retirement, it's, uh, if you have a look on the, you know, on the first uh, tick there, it says you know, 500,000 at 0%. So you're allowed a withdrawal uh, uh, or in pre-retirement and at retirement, 
the one third, basically say, for example, if there's 500,000 in the one third that you accumulated over a period of time, that would be a zero, you would not be taxed on that. So there's another tax advantage. If you do break the thresholds, okay, and I don't want to get too technical, of the 27 and a half or the 350, so that means you are saving more than 350,000 per annum, okay, that will be carried over onto your retirement. And very importantly, uh, you could possibly pay no tax going from an income perspective post retirement. So if you do not have a retirement annuity or you need to relook at it, uh, if you do have one, um, I think it, it's the most important vehicle for every client out there. The other vehicle we can look at as on the second step is the tax-free savings accounts. Now here you can contribute, and this is something that you know the South African government legislation has come in to say, we want to increase the culture of saving within South Africa. So why not give that tax-free to clients, to our citizens? And you can contribute 36,000 per annum up to 500,000. So it'll take you around here, is it about 12 to 13, 13 years to contribute that 500,000. But remember, you are now accumulating or growing your capital from, you could do a recurring investment. It doesn't mean that you have to go into it annually. You could do it 3,000 Rand per month. You could do it 1,500, all just depends as to what, uh, depending on your affordability. And as you get older, you're able to then increase that recurring premium as well. So what does that mean? When uh, the tax-free actually comes to the fore at retirement, you have now uh, received a zero, zero tax income from this tax freeze because you can actually withdraw from that at retirement. So that's another vehicle uh, which is out there which you should actually be looking at and how to maximize the tax-free savings account. Now for our other investors who need liquidity, uh, we look at a, a cash option uh, where we give a money market rate. And you can see at the bottom of the screen in, in the left block there, uh, where money market is used, there's certain exemptions. If you are under 65 and over 65, we have certain thresholds uh, where we, we say that uh, you can utilize your interest exemption, the 23,800 before 65 and over 65 at 34,500. So that's annual where uh, you can actually, instead of paying a certain tax on it, um, we would, uh, or by legislation, you would actually be reduced on those specific amounts. That also applies for the, the fourth vehicle, which is the investment plan. So clients who have uh, a less than 30% marginal tax rate and who would like to either do a recurring or a lump sum investment can actually use the investment plan. And that is basically purchasing unit trusts. Um, so there's a lot of advantage, advantages in there and there is liquidity as well. And then the last point is an endowment. Now an endowment has quite a few tax advantages. And one of them is it's, we call it taxed within the fund. The investment is taxed at an income tax rate of 30% and a CGT of 12%. So that's standard, meaning that the proceeds are not taxable. So we have five-year endowments within Glacier and Sunlam. Uh, you are able to also do recurring endowments if you want to accumulate wealth. And you need to look at yourself and say, if my tax bracket is over 30%, let's speak to my financial advisor and see uh, how can we structure an endowment going forward because there's, there's quite a few advantages in that specific vehicle. So I've given you a high level overview of the different vehicles and, and the tax efficiencies or savings within them. So it all depends on you, the client, as to where you are, what stage you are in your investment life. Uh, if you're starting out, starting at, you know, with a retirement annuity or tax-free, and if you've accumulated wealth over a period of time, whether it be discretionary money, or if you're coming to retirement at compulsory, how do we take that lump sum and reinvest it into one of our products where we create a, a solution for you, a bespoke, tailor-made, so that you can achieve a maximum growth? And th these are the, the important decisions uh, at retirement and pre-retirement as well. You want to ensure that you do not lose capital. Um, you may look for income, whether that be on, as flexibility of income or on a guaranteed income sort of way. Um, we have guaranteed investments as well. Or you're looking for growth. If you are a younger client, um, 
you want to accumulate and keep on accumulating on, so that you have enough for retirement and for all your financial needs. Now at retirement, it's quite important as well. Uh, a lot of clients want to leave a legacy. It's something very unique to KZN. Uh, majority of clients like to leave a legacy. What does that mean? So if they die, you know, uh, can that then move over to their beneficiaries, et cetera. And those uh, vehicles which I've spoken about um, do have that in place, not all of them. And again, it's a conversation that you can go into more detail with your fi uh, financial advisor through Sunlam. So the fourth week giveaway is Amina Arbi. Well done that you will be receiving a Sunlam promotional items. Uh -huh, that's a, a very nice and, and lovely prize pertaining to engineering. Um, I want to thank you for your time. Um, and what I'd like to do is that, you know, you for more details, and I know I've gone through uh, the presentation in, in, in a very, as I say, you know, simplistic, high level overview. There's a lot of detail in there. Chat to your Sunlam financial advisor, uh, whether it's Tutukani, Hashika, or, or Mervyn. They will guide you and assist you and give you the correct financial advice according to your need. So that is the important thing um, that we need to realize there. I'd like to thank you for your time, giving me the opportunity, uh, Sharon. Uh, I think you know this is this is a wonderful series that uh, that you are having, and we would like to you know still enable our clients to ensure that they are abreast of uh, all the the knowledge that is out there. Uh, within the investment space. Thank you, be safe and take care. Thank you, Yusuf. Thank you for that presentation. I have to say your inflation slide really uh, put things into perspective from a VW to a pair of socks. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's actually crazy. I mean, yeah, um, I mean, you could even buy a motorbike. And I just went, you know, it's like diminishing from a vehicle to a, uh, it's a car, motorbike, bicycle, shoes, and then we get the socks. And we, we you know in 10 years time, it'll be what we'll be able to buy for a thousand rand. <laughs> yeah, interesting stuff and scary times ahead. Uh, but yeah, so guys, just uh, to remind you, um, Yusuf did put up the the code that you guys can scan in order to enter the competition for week number five. And then Michelle's gonna add uh, the link for everybody to enter um, into the chat box. Thank you again, uh, Yusuf. And yeah, we look forward to the next presentation. Have a good evening, everyone. Point, <laughs> thank you. At this point, I'd like to welcome Dr. Kuliswa who will take us uh, through an introduction for our keynote speakers and their presentation for the evening. Dr. Kaliswa. Thank you very much for um, that intro and um, for um, the presentation that you've just had. Um, so um, welcome again uh, to this uh, session. I just want to introduce to you the, our speaker now uh, from SNEC, and that's um, um, Mr. Skalfik, I'm, I'm not so sure whether I'm pronouncing that correctly, but he joined SMEC South Africa uh, Structures Function in the Cape Town office in um, early 2000. Um, he spent the next eight years uh, working on some of SMEC's more uh, prestigious projects, um, which include the award-winning uh, Mount Encom interchange upgrade. He has spent the majority of his career as part of uh, uh, the site supervision team on Sunrail projects, which has further contribu contributed to uh, the high standard and quality of service uh, as it is expected from Sunrail. Uh, he holds a BTEC degree in civil engineering and, and uh, structures and has been professionally registered with EXA since 2013. He is currently the resident engineer at the um, Sikauba River Bridge uh, project. Uh, so let's um, uh, hear from him next. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Galiswa. Um, I just want to get my presentation quickly up. Uh, just give me a second. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. I think, firstly, um, 
I need to thank um, SICE Durban again. Um, this is the second time that we we are sort of working together with you guys. So you have invited us to to present Sunlam, and then the UK is then sort of for giving us the opportunity to showcase this project. Um, I think uh, you'll see as we go sort of through the presentation, and unfortunately we don't have a lot of time, so um, it's really in broad strokes that we're going to be looking at the presentation or um, at the project itself. But it is every bit as spectacular as people have made it out, and it's a great opportunity to share um, share some information and share some inf um, pictures and, and footage of, of the project and sort of educate um, some of the people, you know, just to showcase this project a little bit. Um, so what we're going to be looking at in broad strokes will be a bit of a project overview. We will look at the scope of works, the main structure, some of the minor structures, and then the progress of the works to date. So if we start with a project overview, we'll, I'll show you a quick video just to to sort of show you guys Sunrail's involvement, who is our employer or client for this project. which is a short little video that sort of really captures, I think, the spirit of the development here in the Eastern Cape. Um, then we'll look at a bit of the background in terms of the old toll road and um, or the old toll road project, as well as the bridge itself. I thought I'd put some nice pictures in of the local scenery because the Wild Coast is as pretty as, as they make it out to be. <clears throat> and then we'll look at just some very basic contract information. So first thing, we, I'm quickly going to show you this video, and I hope that everybody receives sort of the audio and the quality of the video um, well. I remember arriving in the Trans Sky in 1983. Back then, traveling on gravel roads in poor condition, roads that made access for local communities, extremely difficult. I've been in the Eastern Cape ever since and been fortunate enough to witness and contribute to infrastructure upgrades and developments that have literally changed people's lives. Well, we're not done yet, not even close. I'm here today to tell you about a project that's been in the planning for the past 30 years and will finally commence construction in January of 2019, the Imsikaba Bridge. With the support of local community leaders, municipalities, royal houses, traditional leaders and provincial authorities, Sanro will develop the largest cable state bridge in South Africa, right here in Ponderland. This bridge is for the local communities and all South Africans. Approximately three to 400 skilled and unskilled workers will be employed. This number is small compared to the 6,000 plus jobs in the development of the connecting highways either side of the bridge. Sanral has a responsibility to the communities affected by the infrastructure development. Sanral makes sure that they are not only cared for, but will actually benefit from the construction taking place. My name is John Gibbard and I am a civil engineer, project manager and member of the project team developing the N2 Wild Coast Highway. I have been involved in this project since conception and I feel extremely privileged to be involved in its implementation. Even though it has been 30 years in the making, it is time well spent because Sanwell knows that the development is welcome here and will change people's lives for the better. Right, so that's, that was just sort of a video showing Sunrail's involvement in the development of the Wild Coast Toll Road, as, as it has become to known. So just in terms of the background of the whole project, the bridge that we're going to be discussing with the Carver Bridge tonight actually forms part of a much larger project um, called the Wild Coast, Wild Coast Toll Road, which really it, it, um, exists of the upgrade of the N2 and the R61 between East London and Durban. And to give you an idea, the, the existing alignment of the N2 was determined back in 1936 and completed in 1946. And as 
pretty much stayed the same and forms really one of the main um, primary accesses into the area. Along with that is the paved R61, which if you've been in the Eastern Cape, sort of runs from Lusiki Siki or Port St. John's to Lusiki Siki to um, Port Edward. This was completed in the 1970s and early to middle 1980s. So as you can see, it's it's really time time for the Eastern Cape to 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 get um, infrastructure upgrade. Then the Wild Coast Toll Road, <clears throat> the new road is approximately well, say new road. A portion of it is greenfield, and a portion of it is actually the the upgrade of the existing existing road, and it's approximately 560 kilometers long. As you heard from the video, the conceptual design started back in 1983, um, and once completed. And as I know it doesn't seem significant, the road will be about 85 kilometers shorter than the existing. But more importantly, it'll be up to about three hours faster, particularly for heavy freight vehicles between Durban and, and East London. So that is quite significant in terms of transport in our country. Um, the road will, will include two mega bridge structures. One we'll be talking about tonight, the Misikaba Bridge, and then the other one, the Mtenti River. So on the right, you'll see the picture at the right, this is the Mtenti River Bridge. It's about 237 meters above the valley floor and it's about 1.2 kilometers long. So quite a significant structure as well. And then the picture below, that's the Misikaba Bridge that we'll be talking about tonight. So both of these bridges <clears throat> were originally designed in 2002 to 2003, after which the project sort of went on the shelf for a while. And after after getting the go ahead, there was a design check and update of the design done in 2016. So where are these projects located? As you can see from the map, we are sort of 420 odd kilometers north of East London, about 320 kilometers south of Durban. Um, it's located in the Greenfields portion of, of the, the new N2 or the Wild Coast N2 road which really runs from Port Edwards through Lusikisiki to the other side of Port St. John's. The closest bank in terms, or the closest um, towns in terms of the Misikaba River Bridge is Lusikisiki to the south and um, Flagstaff to the north. And just <clears throat> to give you an idea of the sort of how, how beautiful the area is around here, because myself and quite a few people who are currently involved in the project, none of us have ever actually been down to the wild coast. And you see the unspoiled coastline and it, it is spectacular. And this road will, will definitely promote tourism down here. And once it's up and running, I will definitely suggest that you guys come down here. One thing that's quite spectacular around here and that this portion of the wild coast is coast is quite um, um, known for are the waterfalls. <clears throat> These are just a few of the waterfalls sort of in and around the, um, the site. Interesting story is the waterfall here, the one called Ntentula, is a waterfall that's literally on our wall road just next to the site. And when we came here, we actually sent our surveyor to go and survey the height of the waterfall. And interestingly enough, it came back, I think, at 192 meters. Uh, Sunrail actually, I think, sent the information to the tourism board, who then figured out that this waterfall that nobody actually knew of <clears throat> was the second highest waterfall in the country. So that was quite interesting. In terms of the contract information, I think just very basically, I don't think we're going to go, we're, well, we're definitely not going to go into too much detail. Like I said earlier, the employer in this case is Sunrail, the South African National Road Agency. The design engineers is ourselves, SMEC South Africa, in partnership with a company called, used to be called Alcro in the UK and Axis. We formed a joint venture part partnership called the HVAJV. Then the main contractor is also a joint, joint venture partnership between Concord, who is a local company, <clears throat> construction company that you all should be familiar with, and a Portuguese company called Motor Angel. Contract value at the time of tender, excluding VAT, is 1.65 billion Rand. So just a quick look at the scope. Obviously, 
main the main bridge, which is a 580 meter single span cable state bridge. Part of the project is also five tributary structures, which we'll also have a quick look at later. And then two short sections of approach roadworks on either side of the gorge, um, totaling about, I think it's about two kilometers on each side. So not significant roadworks, really a structures focused project. So moving on to the main structure, which I think is really where, what everybody wants to know about. We're gonna be looking at just a few items. A very quick look at the design development. Um, we'll look at some facts and figures, interesting facts and figures about the bridge. We'll have sort of just a single slide just showing you sort of this a state cable system and its components and how it works. Um, we'll look at the pylons, which are these Y-shaped um, tall towers. We'll look at the anchor blocks, we'll look at the deck, the state cables, and then finally the construction sequence. So just from a design development point of view, obviously during the conceptual design of the bridge, a few options were explored. <clears throat> One of which was a suspension bridge as you see in the picture. Um, one of the main advantages of suspension bridge like this is you can have quite a light steel deck, but with that comes the problem of quite significant <clears throat> on-site fabrication and welding work, which really isn't a good idea, especially in a remote location like we are. <clears throat> so that idea wouldn't work. A second option that was explored was an arch bridge. Um, so you, you'll probably see this and think of blow crowns, which is quite a, quite a famous arch bridge in South Africa. But given the size of the gorge, the main span on this arch would probably would be in the region of about 460 meters, which really pushes the envelope in, you know, internationally in terms of what the arch bridge could do. Um, on top of that, the arch itself and, and the columns would have to be um, hollow steel sections filled with concrete, which again poses the problem of quite a significant amount of on-site um, fabrication and welding works. So we then finally moved on to the stay cable bridge, which is the form that it's taken and the design that's been done and the bridge that's currently being built. So this ticked quite a few of the boxes. Um, it unfortunately still involves a bit of, um, a bit of on-site fabrication and welding works, um, but Overall, aesthetically, it's quite pleasing and it gives us the ability to spend, you know, 580 meters across the gorge without interfering with the forest at the bottom, which is quite, quite important. So when we look at some of the facts and the figures, if you like, um, so like I said, the deck span, 580 meters single span, which is quite significant. It's quite a long span bridge. Um, the height above the valley floor is about 192 meters. Earthworks, about 800,000 cubic meters of cut, of which about 500,000 cubic meters are in rock, um, which is quite a significant amount. And we've had quite a strict specification in terms of our, our rock excavations. So all excavations on this project has been, um, we use the drilling and blasting techniques, um, controlled blasting techniques to, to chisel out the foundations um, for the structure without disturbing the in situ rock mass. There is about 50,000 cubic meters of concrete in the structure. Um, for those of you who can do quick math, that's probably 120,000 tons of concrete, which is quite significant. Reinforcing, reinforcing steel, there's about 4,300 tons. Structural steel, about 3,000 tons. And then <clears throat> the cables making up the, the, the stay cables for the bridge, that's 1,090 tons. So what that really means is if you take every cable and lay them out end to end, it's about 930 kilometers. So basically a cable a length from Cape Town to Bloemfontein, more or less. And then just a graphic rep representation of what we just spoke about, the main span, the back spans 130 meters, height above the valley floor. 192 to put that sort of into perspective the height above the valley floor 
just a simple representation. I don't know how many of you have seen the new Leonardo building in, in Sant and in Johannesburg. That's currently the tallest building in South Africa at 234 meters. So almost fits under our bridge at this stage. Um, interesting fact, currently the highest bridge in South Africa is Blow Counts, is about 216 meters. Um, Tentu will, will be 227 and then Sikaba will actually be the third tallest or the third highest after it's complete. And then just a quick look, simple look to just sort of for those who don't know, simple graphical representation of what a state cable bridge sort of looks like and the systems and work. So we have the pylon or the tower. We have the deck spanning out across, uh, across the valley. The deck cantilevers, it's being held back by these cables, which we call mainstays, and then anchored back with a backstay, which is also a set of cables. And in our, in our design on our bridge, these backstay cables are anchored by <coughs> gravity anchors, which we'll discuss a little bit later. So just for the sake of interest as well, the, the bridge is actually built from both banks simultaneously. So these are cantilever sections until they meet in the middle, we will join them up. So we're first gonna look at the pylon in a bit more detail. So as you can see from the picture here, the, the pylons are um, tapered circular or hollow, if you want, shafts, and they have the shape of an inverted Y, and they're all um, reinforced concrete. At the bottom, the legs are inclined and they straddle the main ro roadway here. Yeah. Interesting thing is that the, the pylon itself is actually hollow, so there's doorways on either side or, or on either one of the legs where you can actually access the pylon and climb all the way up. The pylon is 127 meters high, and at the very top, it's got a diameter of 4.5 meters. And just above the bifurcation or the connection of the legs, it's got a diameter of six meters. Um, <clears throat> the, the pylon is situated on two concrete um, pad foundations, which were dug into the rock and sits within the in-situ rock. This pylon actually sits 25 meters away from the edge of the gorge. Another interesting fact is that these two pylon legs are actually connected by a one meter deep um, connecting slab, which has got, this is the picture you see at the bottom, which really is a main tension member, <clears throat> keeping the legs from, from splitting when the load is transferred to the cables down the shaft. The interesting thing about the pylons further at the top, where the main stake cables and the back stake cables actually anchor into the pylon. So those of you who know um, cable stay bridges, you'll know that in some bridges you'll have stays actually pass over, over the supports and not be anchored dead like we have it shown here. But in our case, each, anchor, each stay cable is actually anchored within the pylon and, uh, and these are the dead anchors and then the live anchors are down in the anchor blocks and on the deck. So the difference between a live and a dead anchor is basically the dead anchor is, as it is explained, it's just a static anchor, if you like. And then the live anchor is actually where you, you stress the cables from to get the tension that you need. There are 17 cables, um, 17 mainstay cables and 17 backstay cables. Then at the top where these, where these cables actually anchor into the pylon, we've got this typical anchorage or steel liner, if you like. So this is what gets cast in the anchors or the stays are anchored at two meter centers vertically. And so every two meters you have an anchorage lining like this. And to put that into perspective, down below the contractor at some stage had to do an abnormal, abnormal load um, investigation to see if we could transport these anchorages down to site. And as you can see, this is a typical low bed truck and it's got two sets or two anchorages liners on it. So they're quite significant and quite big. Then moving to the anchorage, the back anchors or the anchor blocks. So this is the part at the back we, we looked at earlier that actually anchors the structure. 
So in many instances, you will have the backstay anchorages anchored into the rock, you know, or the structure will be actually actively anchored into the rock. In our design, the anchor block is actually what we refer to as a gravity anchor, which simply means that it is heavy enough to actually resist the uplift that is being caused by the, the cables pulling on the anchor block. So you can see that they're quite significant. They're 50 meters long by 10 meters wide and you know roughly 17 meters deep, which equates to about 6,000 cubic meters of concrete at about 15 and a half thousand tons per anchor block. So that's quite significant. So even though we say that, yes, this is a gravity anchor and we're dependent on its actual self weight to, to keep the bridge upright, um, we are also very much dependent on the interlock of this anchor block um, with the rock mass surrounding it, as well as to ensure that we get good lateral stability or lateral bearing capacity against the rock face in the front. So when the cable, when obviously these, the backstay cables being connected to the pylon and the mainstay cables to the deck, as these cables are pulling, there's a vertical component here and a horizontal force. So the anchor block actually wants to be dragged or dragged forward towards the pylon because people always look at the design and they go why is it such an odd shape um, and that's just to ensure that we get good interlock and get maximum efficiency in terms of that bearing that lateral bearing capacity that we need to stop this anchor block from actually sliding forward so as you can see i've, I've actually put uh, a few men on the picture just to give you a scale to put it into perspective these anchor blocks are huge um, another another quite interesting fact or part of the design is because because we are dependent on this um, lateral bearing capacity of the rock mass in front of these anchor blocks, we are also doing what's referred to as consolidation grouting of the rock mass in front of it. So directly in front of each one of these anchor blocks for a 20 meter by 30 meter section, we're actually drilling almost 30 meters down into the ground and in underneath the anchor blocks and high pressure grouting all, all the rock mass to, to consolidate this. Um, and this is just for in case there are fractures or weak zones or intrusions that might collapse when, when the bridge is, is functioning. So we're just making sure that all the rock mass in front of it is of good quality so that we don't get any of that movement. Another interesting thing about the anchor blocks are these U-shaped um, post-tensioning tendons. And you'll see, so for every mainstay or for every backstay cable, so you'll see there's 17 of them. So for every stay cable, there's a corresponding U-shaped post-tensioning tendon that, that extends the full depth of the anchor block. So these tendons actually provide structural capacity it, it, it assists to actually transfer that stay cable anchor or stay cable force and ensures that it activates the full depth of the anchor block. Um, then you'll see on the picture on the right here, yeah, we've also got a gallery, inspection gallery inside the anchor block. And as you can see from the little scale man there, you can, if you're shorter than 1.8 meters, walk up straight. <laughs> In there, and this is obviously to, to assist with the installation of the stay cables, but also then in future for maintenance and replacement of cables should it be required. Then <clears throat> moving on to the deck structure. So the deck is what we call a composite deck and it's steel and concrete, which basically just means it's got a steel subframe with a concrete slab on top. The steel frame consists of two longitudinal, uh, longitudinally welded box girders, which you can see here. And again, these, to give you a scale, um, you can actually walk upright within these boxes. These two um, box girders are then connected with, transversely connected with um, these truss type um, cross frames. And the deck, so the composite deck portion is about 530 meters long. There's two in situ pieces of, of, of portions of deck on either side of the gorge. And like I said earlier, they're constructed from both banks. Then 
each side, so each half of the bridge actually has 17 deck segments. And a typical deck segment is about 15 meters long. And each segment, as you can see from this depiction, actually has a stay cable anchorage. So for the 17 um, stay cables, main stay cables, there are 17 deck segments that's going to be launched out. Then if we look at the cross section and geometry, it's sort of of the deck, we'll see that's quite a wide deck. Um, it supports a dual two lane carriageway with a clear width of about 16 meters between the barriers. We've also designed a cantilever walkway, which has got a clear width of about 1.4 meters. And importantly, has a 2.8 meter high safety barrier um, so that we don't have accidents, accidents on the on the bridge. Um, then I just wanted, I, I actually have two quick slides that I put in last minute because I thought I'll just have a quick talk to you guys about the actual cables or, or the stays um, because not everybody knows this. So, so a main stay or a stay cable like this, even though we call it a cable, in our design, we use something called a parallel strand system. Basically, what that means is the main cable, if you like, is made up of a number of smaller cables. And each one of the smaller cables actually has seven individual wires. Um, they are all galvanized. Then there's a corrosion protection wax inside. And each one of these strands have, a, have their own coating as well. And then bundle together, if you like, into a bigger HTP sheath that actually makes up the anchorage. Um, the stay cable system that we are using, you might recognize the Malau viaduct here on the picture on the right. So we're using a system from Frasene that the contractor has chosen. Um, it's it was developed back in the 1970s and it's and it's been well used across uh, international borders on some of the biggest cable stays uh, bridges in the world. And it's also a multi-strand par parallel system. Um, what this means is that the installation and tensioning of the individual strands are done exactly like that in as individual strands. Every one of these strands um, are protected against corrosions and individual removal and replacement of these strands is possible through the system. Okay, moving on to the construction sequence, because that's also something everybody wonders about. How do we actually build this? How do we go about cantilevering, you know, close on 300 meters out over the gorge? So this is a simple depiction, I think, as, as we could make it. So really, the first, you need to complete the pylon and you, can, you need to complete the actual anchor at the back. The very first thing after that that you would do is you would install the backstay for the simple reason that you don't want to be out on the gorge without the backstay in place, otherwise the pylon might tip forward. So you would install the backstay. You would then have a launching gantry, um, which will actually pick up one of those 15 meter deck segments, can deliver it out, lower it down, and it gets welded onto the previous segment. <clears throat> After that, the mainstay cable, main cable is installed and the process sort of repeats itself. Um, so what I'm going to do now is show you a, a short video clip, um, which actually is was, was made up specifically for this project, um, which really explains the process of, uh, quite a bit better. So let me just see if I can get it to play. So yeah, you can see the pylons. Um, this is basically like a launching yard where the segments are being delivered. Um, some painting work and assembly work is done. After which the segments gets transported to the front. So this big yellow structure that you see here, this is the actual launching gantry. This is what actually takes the deck segment out across the gorge. 
So a segment is transported to the launching gantry. It's then rotated through 90 degrees and lowered into place. After which this underslung gantry, um, which is also there for permanent maintenance works, but the contract in this case is using it as well for the construction purposes. The segments is then the segments are welded. Once the longitudinal boxes have been welded up, the mainstay cables are then installed. After this, the launching gantry will um, retract slightly, and then the <clears throat> the underdeck gantry then actually comes into play again, which is used to place the formwork between these cross girders. Once the formwork is in place, um, the reinforcing is placed and <coughs> sorry, this steel fixing is quite slow on this video. Yeah, after which the concrete is then then placed on the deck and the whole process basically repeats itself. So I'm just, there we go. Struggling a bit with the technology here. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, that's in sort of broad strokes a little bit about the main structure and specifically, you know, how we envisage of, of building it. Um, <clears throat> then we spoke earlier about the, the minor structures that are also here. So we call them minor structures on this project um, only because they seem to be tiny compared to, compared to the big bridge. But as you can see from the key plan, <clears throat> you have the main bridge over the gorge here Starting from the south, you've got tributary one, which is a box culvert, tributary two, which has got a box culvert and a pedestrian underpass, then tributary three on the other side, which is actually a bridge, and then tributary four. <clears throat> and we'll just have a quick look at these. Um, tributary one uh, is a double barrel box culvert. It's 100 meters long, which if any of you know culverts, that's quite significant significant four and a half meters high and 6.8 meters wide and it's about 18 meters under the roadway and so i'm again struggling with this yeah so all this is, is just a quick flyover that we did just to give you a bit more perspective you know pictures don't always um don't always show things as or doesn't usually show you sort of give you good perspective so as you can see it's cool. they've got both um, drop inlet and outlets and quite significant outlet works because <clears throat> not too far from the outlet of this uh, structure there's there's a cliff edge with a waterfall so it's quite important that we slow the water down significantly moving on to the tributary two structure so as you can see from the picture on the right this is the drainage culvert again you'll see quite a significant outlet works for the same reason from this edge 20 meters down there's probably a 60 meter high waterfall so it's quite important that we as because we're accelerating the water through these culverts we need to actually slow it down on the back end this culvert is about 70 meters long four and a half meters wide a high and 4.2 meters wide and with about 10 meters of fill over it on top of that full is actually a pedestrian underpass, which sits sort of closer to the underside of the road. Um, it's about 27 meters long. So at the top of the full, four and a half meters wide and 4.2 meters wide or high. And it's got some aesthetically pleasing sort of wing walls, as you can see from the, from the picture below. Moving on, oh, sorry, there's just a, quick flyover of, of the culvert, just again to, to give you a little bit of perspective. Yep, 
Yeah, so moving on to trip three, which is on the north. So like we said earlier, it's this one is not a culvert. It's actually a three span um, flat slab bridge of which the, the piers are integral. So in other words, no bearings uh, monolithically connected to the deck. The bridge is about 32 meters long um, and about 23 meters wide and approximately about six meters above the, above the water level. So again, just a little flyover um, of the current progress. So as you can see, quite large abutments, stepped abutments with four individual piers. What this bridge also has is a suspended slab walkway, sort of a small bridge under the bridge um, for pedestrians to cross over. Then moving on to the last of the tributary structures. So this is tributary four, all the way to the north extent of the project. This one is quite big as well, 88 meters long, single barrel box culvert. It's 5.2 meters high and about four meters high, uh, wide, and has about 14 meters of fill over it. And again, just a quick fly over, fly over if you like, again, Drop inlet, um, inlet works. Quite a tall and bulky structure given the size of the fill um, that goes over it. So you'll see that the in or the outlet works has not been constructed yet as we need to do some deviations on the all roads. Yeah, and then moving on, the, you probably might have read it somewhere in the news in the last few months, but we have something very unique on this project and, and that's a cable car. Um, because the gorge is about 600 meters wide, <clears throat> but to actually drive from the South Bank to the North Bank is probably anything between two and a half and three hours drive on, on really bad dirt roads. And it's the same contract, you know, we, we've got a single contract to constructing the whole bridge. And similarly with the engineering team, we are one engineering team. So getting across from the one bank to the other bank was quite a headache. So in the contract, there was allowance made for the contractor to, to install a temporary means of crossing the gorge during construction. The contractor opted for this mono rope um, cable car system. Uh, which was designed by a very famous Swiss company. And it's more than 600 meters long and it only takes about five minutes to cross the gorge. And it's actually quite spectacular and quite a unique feature to this project. And a first, as far as I know, in, in South African construction. So that only leaves us with sort of the general progress. And I think you've sort of seen most of it, but I have one last video that's not too long. Um, that just really shows from end to end, um, puts everything into a bit of perspective. So yes, so starting from the south side, obviously you'll recognize tributary one, coming up and we're flying on the drone is actually flying on the on the road alignment the permanent road alignment coming up the road on the right hand side you'll see that we have a mobile crushing plant we we are actually crushing um, quite a bit of the blasted rock that has come out of the road cuttings and the foundation excavations. And this crash material we're using actually to upgrade some of the local roads and the approach roads, which is done by um, local SMMEs and local companies. So coming up to tributary two, you will now see sort of the Southern site and the layout area, as well as the anchor blocks, the angular anchor blocks um, the excavations and the pylon at the front. So this is another 
perspective. The interesting thing is if you look at the tower crane, the tower crane is about 60% of the height of the final or the final height of the pylon. So which means the tower structure, the pylon structure is very close to double the height of the crane that you see there. As you can see, we've progressed somewhat with the southern pylon legs. Um, yeah, so moving on to the north, again, coming from the north towards the south, you will see tributary four first. Again, crossing over what is quite a significant fill and then approaching the tributary three bridge, which both the approaches are in cut. I mean, actually quite a significant cut, to be honest. You'll see a lot of blasted material that still needs to be excavated. Then coming up to, to the northern anchor blocks or the northern site, if you like. Again, very similar. Um, these excavations are complete and they've, they haven't started with the construction yet, so they look a bit deeper than the south. Yeah, then coming round, have a better view or different view of the anchor block excavations. Then you'll see the little um, cable car station in the background there and with the cables running across the gorge. So here you can see the cut where the bridge deck will actually um, pass through the, or daylight through the front of the, the cliff edge. Yes, so, and that sort of brings us to the end. Um, Thank you very much for listening to me and I hope you guys weren't too bored um, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. And at some point when all the COVID restrictions are at the end, we would love to have you guys over to come for a site visit and we'll take you around and actually show you the works. Thank you, Gert. Um, I suppose everybody is as gobsmacked and as jaw dropped as I am. This project is just mesmerizing. I don't think there's any other words to describe it. But yeah, so um, I am looking forward to the panel discussion. Um, I am going to now introduce the rest of your team and also reintroduce Dr. Kaliswa, who will take us through the panel discussion. So if you guys could just turn on your camera. Uh, so for all our attendees, our panel discussion will be um, Along will be held with uh, Hert, who is the RA for, uh, for SMEC, and then Dr. Kaliswa from UKZN. And then we have uh, Mr. John Anderson, who is the head of structures, the lead designer and the project manager. And then we have Mr. John McCall, who is the technical principal for construction and pavements. Welcome guys, round two. Okay, so Dr. Kaliswa, can I just have your camera on and uh, for you to unmute yourself? Let me do that. Um, I will just plunge into darkness. I hope um, I'm visible. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope you can hear me now. Yeah, so we'll go into um, some um, discussions. Uh, we have um, quite a number of uh, questions that will um, be um, uh, sharing and, and discussing. And I know as, as we go along, we'll have build up on, on the same. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hope you can all hear me quite well. So uh, the first question is, uh, or this is from a student. Um, they are asking um, whether they can and how they can be part of the, the project, uh, whether they are uh, slots for vacation work or some volunteering uh, options uh, on, on this ongoing project.
And then we have um, a, a question from <laughs> Justin. Uh, so maybe I'll just go through them and then uh, we can uh, pick them, uh, the responses as we go along. Um, Justin is uh, asking whether you can share some of the design considerations to accommodate wind loading and uh, any instabilities. Yeah, I mean, John, McCall, maybe you can answer the first question. Yeah. You know, in okay. Terms of, you know, because I think it's it's a it's a good question. Yeah. So let's let's answer that one. Yeah. Um, at the moment, we don't have the facilities for people to come in work as vacation students. Uh, what Sanwell does have is uh, students that are hired to complete their training, and those are done through the Sanwell processes. Um, and of course, um, we have uh, visits and so on. And that's where I'm sure we can accommodate you if you come to site to have a good look around. And uh, we can certainly do that for over the day. But in terms of sort of volunteering, we don't have that facility at the moment. Yeah, I think, John, if I, if I may add to that, um, and I don't want to talk on behalf of the, of the main contractor, but, you know, the main contractor does have some students and if anything, it might be worth, you know, talking to them to see for in terms of vacation work, no guarantees. And like I said, they're not here at the moment. So I'm sort of talking on their behalf, but there's always an opportunity with the contractors. Yeah. So I think, I think that's the answer to either contact Sandal, the Southern region, um, you know, they, they, they have, may have employment opportunities or the contractor or Spec South Africa. Yeah. yeah. And then just, I think the, sorry, the next question was on the, on the wind, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Um, Design Moses. considerations to accommodate the wind loading and instabilities. Yeah, so I, I, I can maybe answer that one. Um, so obviously with any long span structure, um, wind loading is a, is a key, key element. Um, you know, what, what happens is you, you basically have two, two, two responses or we categorize them in two ways. One is buffeting and vortex induced vibrations, which are really small amplitude vibrations um, that affect the serviceability of the bridge. You know, do you feel comfortable on the bridge when the wind is buffeting and there's vortexes around the bridge. And then the other aspect that we have to test is the, uh, is the stability of the bridge in, uh, in, in a wind of, in, in a, in, 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 you know, to certain wind speeds. So it's a global stability um, issue. So you get what they call flutter or galloping where the bridge essentially starts to interact with the wind and respond to the wind and sometimes those amplitudes get very large and if they get very large, it can actually cause the collapse of the bridge. Um, so what we have to do is we have to do testing in a laboratory. And we actually did that in Canada way back in 2005, where we built little global models of the, of the deck cross section and we tested those for the buffeting and the vortex induced vibration. And then we actually built a full, full, full sort of terrain model we placed a, a miniature model of the bridge in the terrain, and then we checked the global stability of the bridge. And what you have to do is you, you have to profile the edge of the deck. That's very important in terms of the response so that the wind can slip and flow above and below, above and below the deck. And, you know, for example, you have to, we, we have porous steel parapets instead of the non, normal concrete parapets that you see on bridges around South Africa. And the reason for that is to, is to increase the porosity of the cross section um, and to reduce vortexes as the wind splits and goes above and below. So basically from those tests that we do in these laboratories, we get quasi-static forces that we then apply to the design of the bridge. Okay, um, thank you for that. Just uh, from, from that, uh, you mentioned that you did some tests about a few years ago? Yes, so back in, I think it was 2005, 2006, oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and how is it, in, I know there's always progress in terms of uh, test standards and procedures. Um, are there updates uh, just to follow up that? 
the data or the results obtained 10 years ago is still okay for application now? Um, I, I, yes, uh, you know, we, we haven't redone the testing. Um, uh, what, what, what is, what is going to happen is that, um, uh, you know, what, we, what was considered safe in 2005, six is still safe today. Uh, um, you know, and, and the physical means of modeling hasn't changed, but um, what will happen is the contractor is, is doing his own wind tunnel testing for the construction stages. So he's got to check the stability of the bridge as it cantilevers out over the gorge. So there will, there is sort of more wind tunnel testing being done that the contractor is actually commissioning. Um, and uh, obviously if anything comes out of that, that doesn't correlate with the testing that was done previously, um, mm. we, we, we would have to uh, have to have some response to that. Okay. All right, thank you. Moving forward, uh, there's a question on um, this, uh, height of the stream to the bridge, how does that affect construction? That's your one. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't affect the construction at all. Um, if the river was much bigger and the water a bit closer, we could have uh, barged the sections in <laughs> and we wouldn't have mm. to launch them from the top. But no, it has no effect on, on the construction sequence or on the construction at all. Other than being very scary. <laughs> All right, uh, there's a question from, um, uh, I think it's one of the students asking about the foundation type used for the pylons <clears throat> and, and what informed the choice of, of that foundation type. Obviously we've got rock on, the, on either side. We'd be sitting on top of a, of a cliff. Um, and uh, what we have is pad footings, uh, essentially. But um, as, as I mentioned, you know, the rock mass participates in the structural system. So not only do you have vertical loads from the pylon, you have horizontal loads, horizontal compression thrust from the deck. And those loads combine in the foundation and um, are resisted by the rock mass. Um, but it, it is essentially just a large block of concrete that we use to transfer that stress into the rock mass. Um, and, um, you know, the things that you're worried about is buckling of the rock behind the pylon base, because you're applying a big horizontal thrust to that rock mass. And then obviously the stability of that cliff edge, that's fundamental. So, you know, the geotechnical engineers played a very major part in the design of this bridge in ensuring its stability um, and ensuring that the, the, the movements, the settlements um, were actually negligible. Mm. Yeah, the next uh, question is uh, just uh, um, about measurements. What measurements were put in place to avert erosion of uh, the embankments? Yes. John, do you wanna... Yeah, I think so. The question sort of says, I think, says, how sturdy are the embankments where the pylons are to be installed? So, like John sort of alluded to earlier, with, there was significant geological um, studies undertaken prior to choosing where to put this bridge um, for that very question or reason that you've asked. So obviously we, we are quite confident that the rock is, is sufficient. And as the excavations were undertaken, we've had full-time ge geological engineers and geologists on site, both on the engineer and the contractor side who mapped every crack, who investigated after every bench to make sure and that the rock quality is still the same as what we intended it to be. As far as the stormwater is, uh, the stormwater is concerned. So in and around the structure itself on the pylon, I mean, we are controlling the stormwater via the deck um, and <clears throat> around, the, we obviously doing some, some shaping and landscaping, if you like, around the structure. But generally, the stormwater is controlled via the roads, um, the roads that we put in place and the cuttings that we've made um, and the stormwater installation. So as far as over the cliff edge, you know, for millions and millions of years, the water have been running over that cliff edge. And I, I don't think in the 100 year design life of the bridge that it will make a significant dent into any of the rock mass at the front there. 
Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, the next question or point of discussion is about the environmental impact. Um, what efforts were taken to, to limit environmental impact? Um, perhaps I can answer that one. The, uh, this project, is, as all the projects on the Wild Coast Road, are under huge scrutiny from the environmental community. So we put a lot of effort into making sure that we can't keep the environment as pristine as we can. Certain things that have been done include uh, all plants uh, that are in the area have been uplifted and put into holding areas to be replanted later. Um, we don't have any impact on the, on the main gorge itself. We don't touch it in any way. We've, we've taken special precautions that no rock and et cetera falls into the gorge. Um, on the tributaries, um, we have uh, upstream and downstream measuring of um, things like uh, dissolved oxygen, uh, turbidity, and pH, et cetera, et cetera, so that there can be uh, any indication that uh, our construction works are affecting the, the stream at all. Um, we are also, um, uh, what else are we doing? We, we put in check dams and uh, silt traps on the rivers and streams and around the construction site so that there's no any erosion or the impact of erosion taking silt into the river is contained. And, uh, and then finally, perhaps we have uh, two sets of external environmental audits that come through here and they give us uh, their opinion of what's happening. And so far, these results have ended up in the high 90s in terms of scoring. So I think we actually controlling the environment quite well. Kalisma, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah. The next uh, item is uh, uh, dealing with the expansion joints on the bridge. Um, how are you dealing with that? Um, and then they also like to know if the slab would be positively connected to the uh, steel truss. Yeah, John, do you want to? Okay, yeah, no problem. Yeah, John. So we, we, you know, we're obviously building this bridge with cantilever construction, one bank to the other. Um, the, 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 set, the cantilevers meet in the middle, and at that point, we, there will be an expansion joint. So the, extra, the structural system is relatively straightforward. It's, it's two cantilevers that are essentially connected with, a, with a, a pin connection and an expansion joint in the mid-span of the deck. And, and that's really, um, so there's, a, there's, there's sort of a, a steel bar that goes from the two boxes and connects them. Um, and then on the road surface, we have a multi-element expansion joint. Um, and for the movement ranges, I think serviceability about 380, 400 mil. Yeah, about 400 across, millimeters. Yeah. Yeah, across that, job, that expansion joint. Yeah, I think in, with regards to the second part of the question, whether the steel deck, uh, the concrete is connected positively to the steel deck, um, yes, it is. Um, most of that positive connection is actually transferred to what we call a shear stud or an Nelson stud. So on top of the steel box sections and on top of the top flange of the, the cross frames, there's a number, well, 32,000, um, 25 millimeter shear studs, which connects the, the concrete portion of the deck to the steel portion of the deck, if you like. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the next question is, um, is political, I'll skip that, I'll leave that for um, the last uh, <laughs> the last part of the discussion. Then no, uh, what, don't what... worry, Hank's <laughs> already dealt with them, so it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now uh, what method of construction was used for the pylons, um, given the short term height of construction crane by comparison? Um, yeah, I think I think I can answer this. Um, yeah, I think firstly the pylons are are not complete yet. Um, mm -hmm. As you would have seen from the last sort of video, we are about four lifts up on the pylon leg. The pylon leg itself has six lifts before it meets, um, and then there's two lifts in the bifurcation, and then another 80 odd meters before the top of the pylon. So we're, we're actually still a long way from the top. Um, 
and you're asking how how we are constructing it. So it's sort of called a jump form, which is basically a hand over hand formwork system um, that gets raised up. Um, I, th I yeah, I think you, you asked why the crane is shorter than the pylon. Um, the crane is built in sections, so a tower crane like that can only go to a certain height unsupported. So if you want to make a tower crane higher like that, you actually need to, to put a support on it. You need to stay it somewhere. So the crane is now set up to a height where once the pylon reaches that height, then a support, if you like, from the actual concrete structure to the, to the crane will be put in place. After that, the crane will go up another, I think it's another 60 meters, up to 130 meters. I hope that answers the question. Yes, I hope so. It wasn't quite clear, but I think it's, uh, it was intended to be along those lines. Um, thank you. And another, the next question is, considering the nature of the site, how much of an example of what should not happen um, to the uh, Tacoma Narrows Bridge? I think it's just learning from experiences. Yeah, so that's, that's obviously the Tacoma Narrows collapse because of, you know, um, galloping, which are sort of, you know, the response to the, the response to the interaction of the, of the deck superstructure with with the wind, um, and you had excessive galloping, torsional flutter that started to happen, and those amplitudes grew and grew and grew to the point that it actually caused the collapse of the bridge. So the previous answer I gave with respect to the wind tunnel testing, the you know the the deck um, the profiling of the deck edge, et cetera. So we, we, we extensively tested the bridge to ensure that um, the bridge won't respond in that way to, to excitation from, 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 from the wind. So obviously the Tacoma Narrows taught many lessons and um, you know, um, one, one of those was, was that this, that the, you know, even in low winds that the, that the bridge can start start to interact with the wind, and depending on the frequency, the torsional stiffness of that deck, it starts to um, that the flutter that's caused can grow and grow exponentially, as they say, to the point where the bridge collapses. So, um, as I say, what we do is what engineers now do do is they they profile the deck section and then they test that deck section to make sure that doesn't happen. Dr. Kulis, watches unmute, please. Sorry, sorry about that. There's, there's a question about the design, um, the design aspects, uh, about the software packages used that were used for analysis of the main structures. Yeah, so um, the global analysis was done by JV Partners, um, it's, and, and uh, um, that was done in Lhasa, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, very powerful um, tool. Um, you know, now during construction, the contractors got an erection engineering model, which I believe is the Midas. Midas, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and, and we also have a, have, a, have a model here in South Africa that we'll be using to track the uh, erection sequence. But basically, it's, it's quite an interesting process. There's more than one model that's used for the, for the design of the bridge. Um, you have a, what they call as a wished in place model, i.e. the bridge is just suddenly there. You, you know, and that's kind of what most engineers are used to is, is, is sort of defining the structure um, as, a, as a whole and then applying loads to it and, and generating load effects, et cetera. Um, and, and that wished in place model is generally used for, for live load effects, i.e. transient loading that's applied to the bridge. Um, so transient and, 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 and live load effects. But the, on a bridge like this, the, the construction sequence plays a large part in the load effects that are locked into the structure. So we have what's called a forward building model, um, where the bridge is built in stages, and essentially we, we, we simulate each of the construction stages that will happen. Um, and, you know, it's called a forward building. Um, but 
what what you have to, there's multiple solutions to that forward building model because you have multiple cables um so what you have to do is you have to find that solution and it's quite a difficult thing to get convergence of that model but what you have to set is boundary conditions and usually those boundary conditions are the displacement of the deck or the moments in the deck and you want to limit both so you set those targets and then the forward building runs backwards and forwards and, and tries to find a solution to that because as I say, there's many solutions to it. Um, and the, you know, the, you know, in the past we used to do backward building models where we would unbuild the bridge. But the problem with that was um, that uh, we, we couldn't simulate the creep and shrinkage effects in the, in the concrete with a with the backward building model. So when we originally did the design in 2005, we actually had a backward building model. When we picked up the bridge in 2015-16, the software that we have now today is, is able to do these forward building models um, and incorporate the creep and shrinkage effects. Um, and is the computing power such that it's able to, to converge, find a solution to these models. Um, so those have now been used by ourselves and the contractor in um, going into the construction stage. Okay, thank you. Just to follow up on, on the design aspect, I know um, concrete um, comes in, in different forms, fresh concrete to hardened concrete. So um, are you able to take care of the stress development in fresh concrete at that height during construction? Um, I'm sure there'll be some impact on the set of, or on concrete at, in, in the fresh state. So um, what we have to do is we obviously have to model the age of the concrete through the construction sequence. Um, so the, the concrete is supported with formwork until it gains sufficient strength so that it can obviously support itself. Thereafter, it's, um, you know, the formwork is stripped. Um, and after a curing period of about, um, you know, 14 days, the next construction sequence happens. Um, but um, one of the most important, you know, effects is the shrinkage um, and creep. So those are all age dependent. So within our analysis model, you know, time is an important dimension. So we have to model the age of the concrete and the associated effects that come along with that age. So that's, so those creep and shrinkage effects are, are extremely significant. And it, it's a composite structure. We, you know, we all know that, um, uh, that uh, creep and shrinkage can have a, a, a you know, a significant um, impact on the internal stresses on a composite section. But on, on a big bridge like this, as, as the concrete ages, what it does is it sheds load to the steel box. And that transfer of stress actually causes, you know, long-term load effects in the bridge and it even affects the profile of the bridge. So all those things have to be considered so that, you know, we, we have a target profile we're going to reach after, after we finish construction. But then we also have to check what the profile and the load effects in the bridge will be after 30 years, which is when most of the of the time dependent effects will take place, such as creep and shrinkage. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, the, the next question, the, um, I think they just want to find out whether uh, what, whatever you learned at the university was applicable in the design. <laughs> no, definitely not the university I went to. But the question is how you, to design uh, whether it was directly related to what you learned at university, or was this level of design gathered over time through uh, professional development and experience? I, I think obviously at university you get you get fundamentals of engineering and mathematics that that that, that are the are the foundation for your engineering development. So um, uh, I, I think, you know, at university, you, you obviously learn a lot of theory, but you don't necessarily get a lot of practice, in, you know, um, practice in the industry. Um, so obviously you need both. Um, but I think if I can just talk personally, um, you know, um, I, I was lucky enough to study with, with Rolf Kratz at UCT. 
Um, and uh, he, 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 he built a, a number of major bridges in his time. And he, he was able to teach me the, the, the fundamentals of creep and shrinkage and the, the load effects. That, I, I mean, about the, the design of, of, of large bridges. So, um, and then, you know, obviously, um, you know, in your work career, um, you know, the, you have to learn from people with experience. So you have to find mentorship within the industry. And that's one of the most important decisions you're gonna make as a young engineer. Are you, are you gonna choose where you work because of salary or are you gonna choose where you work because the people there have experience and they can teach you the, 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 the skills and, and, and transfer the knowledge to you that's actually gonna be more valuable to you in the long run. And I think finding that good mentorship working with people who've worked on projects. So, you know, we've, we've been very lucky with respect that we've had a, a long history of, 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 of senior, of good, you know, experienced bridge engineers, and we've been able to maintain that over the years. Um, and uh, I think that's that transfer of knowledge is probably the, the most important aspect. <clears throat> yeah, and I think to students, it's also important to note that um, you learn from everyone from foremen, from steel fixers. So it's sort of just what, it's not just all about maths and physics. It's, there's a lot that goes into, um, into development as, as engineers. Um, the next question is what type of, or types of concrete were used or will be used for the footing and the bridge deck? Types, I'm, I'm not so sure whether they are referring to strength or, yeah, but you can. Yes, yeah, so. I think I can answer that one. Um, you know, the concrete, all the concrete on, on, on this bridge is, you know, what we refer to as durability concrete. So um, the hardened properties are tested for, for durability parameters as well. The concrete in the foundations under the pylon and for the anchor blocks for that matter is all a W4019, so or 20 with the new SVS st standard. So that just means a 20 millimeter stone, um, 40 MPA concrete. I think what is significant about both the foundation structures or the concrete mix design for the foundations is that we actually specified from our side that in terms of the cementitious content, there has to be 70% slag or GGBS, what you guys should know. Um, and the reason why we've specified that the cementitious content be 30% um, same one and 70% um, slag is because the addition of slag actually <clears throat> stunts the initial um, hydration process of concrete. So with some of these um, concrete pours that we're doing, especially on the anchor blocks, you know, we, we're pouring about 470 to 500 cubic meters of concrete in one layer. So at those volumes, um, with normal concrete, if you like, or high strength concrete that we specified in any case, you get the buildup of heat because of the, the, the hydration, which is the exothermic reaction. And the the problem with that is if concrete does if concrete gets too hot, um, it's obviously not good. And then when the concrete cools off at the top quicker than it cools off in the middle, you get something called thermal cracking. So for that reason, when it comes to the concrete mix designs, as the engineers, we were fairly prescriptive, if you like, in terms of what we wanted um, in the concrete mixes. Um, because we were obviously looking out for the thermal behavior of concrete in these large volumes. Hopefully that answers and, the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I believe so. And uh, are you having a, maybe a mechanism in place to um, check the real time development of heat uh, on site? Yeah, yeah. Heat of vibration? No. For sure. So sorry, I actually <laughs> paused over that. But yes, no, you're right. Um, so again, this is something that we prescribed within the specifications is that the contractor shall monitor the heat development and heat loss um, of concrete. So we do this by placing thermocouples, uh, strategically placed thermocouples within the mass specifically that we we are we are casting. Prior to that, um, 
<clears throat> there's also a requirement or we've also done thermal modeling uh, thermal modeling so we, we've actually modeled um, the pore sizes the lift heights and the construction sequence to see how one lift um, influences the next in terms of heat transition or transfer from the one lift to the next and so for every lift we actually um, have these thermal couples inside um, inside the actual concrete and they get left there forever i mean and they relay real-time temperature readings every i think three seconds and we leave them on for at least seven days or until we can see that there's a, a constant um constant and even fall in terms of the temperature from from the peak peak temperature to yeah so yes we are monitoring the concrete yeah cool. thank you um there's another question about uh, community engagement how was the community involved um, and what was their reaction to the to the project john you're on mute okay sorry i didn't uh, got on to mute but anyway um, yes, look, uh, this is a hugely important part of the, any project in, in South Africa today. And uh, Central has set up along the whole road a series of uh, committees and so on, which are called public liaison committees. And those are the people that um, the, the contractor and ourselves deal with in terms of recruiting labor and so on and so forth. We also have uh, uh, many meetings with the uh, business forums that are uh, set up in the area to manage the businesses for SMMEs and subcontractors as a whole. Uh, meetings with people like um, trucking associations, taxi associations are all put together to try and get this harmonious relationship with the site. You, you can imagine with the, the expectations of, um, of people with employment in a very, very, very poor area, where you can only possibly hire a few or a small percentage of those people, there are problems associated with that. But as a general rule, uh, the, the project uh, where we are now has been welcomed by all the local people. Um, and I think that uh, there's only one small area on the, on the Wild Coast Road where there is an issue which the client is dealing with. But in terms of our project here, uh, we seem to have pretty good community relationships with the the municipalities and the chiefs and all these associations that I've just spoken about. And so far, not too many problems and uh, don't expect any more going forward. There's also been quite a, a strong push by the uh, uh, politicians as well to try and make things go smoother. There's a political oversight committee that uh, deals with a lot of issues as and when they appear. So no problems with the side uh, so far. Thank you. Yeah, minimal problems. There are a few, but they're minimal. <laughs> they're minimal, yeah. We, we manage manageable. Okay. Um, about the uh, concrete on the deck uh, for the panels of the slab, why reinforced concrete? I think they wanted to say in situ concrete or a cast in place was um, opted for instead of pre-stressed concrete slabs. Um, look, it, it can be both. Um, uh, you know, in our case, we've got quite a heavily reinforced section, um, and that's because of the long-term creep of shrinkage effects in the deck. You know, the, the, the deck's quite unusual. It's not, you know, most cable state bridges don't have an expansion joint in the middle, or, or a few do. Um, so that structural system, one of the nuances of it is, is that we, we, we do end up with fairly large restraint stresses in the deck and we have to reinforce for those. So the reinforcement is relatively heavy. And I think the practicalities of precast when you have such heavy reinforcements are, are difficult. And then obviously you need to connect the slab to the deck as well, which is that so you have to have pockets, you have to have um, second stage pores, you have to have enough of those to connect the deck to the to the steel box. So, um, you know, this is an employer design. Um, for us, the call was the quality and the durability was best achieved with in situ. But yeah, it can be done with precast. 
um, is, is often done, but um, you have to be very careful with the detailing of the pre-cost planks um, because you have to, you obviously have to pour in in situ pour, you have to connect the rebar top and bottom, and you have to connect, as I say, pockets of that slab to the cross elements and the main longitudinal elements to make sure you can transfer the shear from the deck into the steel box. Yeah. Okay, just to follow up on the choice of materials, there's a question about um, an alternative pavement. Why was a flexible pavement not used on the deck? Yeah, I'm not, I have to admit, I don't know what a flexible pavement is, um, but uh, yeah, we've got large stresses. We need some concrete there to deal with it. Um, so yeah. Um, as I say, not. I think a flexible pavement is, is something that's applicable to, to road design rather than bridge design. Yeah, 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 yeah I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the next uh, question is about um, timelines. Is, is the project running according to plan? Or if there are any issues with the contract at the moment? Um, delays due to COVID or such things? Yeah, I think any, any big project of this nature you know, has its ups and its downs and its sort of issues. Um, obviously, we we were very unfortunate um, to have started this project and within 12 months, you know, COVID hit. So there's no point in denying the fact, you know, that, that COVID obviously has played a big role and has, has caused significant, you know, disruptions to the project, not, not necessarily only when it was in lockdown level five, but there's also obviously a lot of knock-on effects from that. Um, but other than that, you know, like I said, there's been, there's been the normal sort of hiccups, um, but nothing, I don't think anything that's sort of worth mentioning in a forum like this, at least it's, it's at this stage, you know, the contract is, is back on track, you know, sort of recovering from a lot of, you know, like I say, the aftermath of COVID. And yeah, so things are starting to look up again. And yeah, we're confident that we'll get there. Hey, thank you for that. Uh, the next question is about um, traffic focus for, for the route. I'm sure this was considered during design, but maybe you can just talk to it. Oh, John, do you have those figures? I, all I know is that there's I about 30% heavies, which is a considerable amount of heavies. 2,000 so at the time. It's 4,000 yeah. predicted, you know, at the opening. So obviously, you know, that's part of Samuel's economic analysis or of, of these projects. Um, but I, you know, my recollection is um, that, uh, you know, when the project opens, it, it would likely be four to 5,000 uh, vehicles a day on the, on the route. Okay. And then obviously there's a growth, predicted growth, um, that, that that'll probably double within the next five to six years. All right, thank you. And the last question is in terms of uh, costs. Uh, what item is the most expensive or that is taking up uh, the huge amount of cost uh, overall? Well, it is the big bridge. It is the main structure at this stage. <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's a big component of steel in it, both yeah. in the deck and in the, um, in the cables. Um, so, you know, any one single element, that's probably the, the largest, but, um, you know, I, I think, you know, building a, a bridge in, in such a remote area is not an easy feat for the contractor. So the establishment costs are significant. Um, and, you know, he's going to have a number of specialists out there for a number of years doing the, doing the erection engineering. So the temporary works is also you know, although maybe not a major cost, but it, it is a big part of it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, we'll end our discussions here for today. We had more questions, uh, some were um, political, and I propose that we have another session to continue such discussions. But thank you for, for you, for making time, all the panelists and, and the presenter. Um, we really appreciate for your time. Thank you for everyone who attended this meeting. 
Um, uh, we, we really appreciate for sharing this uh, information, uh, new knowledge, new techniques, new skills. There's a lot of uh, things to learn um, for people across um, um, the, 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 the entire uh, engineering um, community. So um, thank you for this unique project. Um, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Kaliswa. And yes, thank you to our speakers and our presenter today. Uh, this project never ceases to amaze. And um, to be honest, Gert, I, I would have thought that uh, you would have said that the cable car was the major cost factor in the project. <laughs> no, but it is a major fun factor. I can tell you that. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I have I have hangouts about you having that cable car on site. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you again. Thanks so much. And um, I just want to thank Sanlam again for uh, making this event possible and to UKZN, specifically Dr. Pringle, who brought um, the initiative to me and, and we brought it to life together. So thank you to you guys. And yeah, attendees, just like that, we're halfway. We're five lectures in and five to go. So before we head, uh, we head into the evening, I just want to give you a forthcoming attraction as I usually do. Uh, next, week's, uh, next week's presentation is a technical talk by Mr. Neil Oliver, and he will take us through the facilitation of uh, sustainable development and the modeling of the benefits. So uh, members with that, I wish you a wonderful evening and I wish you a safe and peaceful week ahead. And I look forward to next week. Have a great evening. Good night. Thank you very much, Sharon. Go well, Thanks, everybody. Sharon. Thanks everyone.